Hello and welcome to Irish Football Fan TV. I'm delighted to be joined by Salford City's Richie Tao. Richie, how are you keeping? I'm good, Paul. Thanks for having me on. How are you? All good, all good. Good to see you. And I believe you're back home now, so you're just taking it all in for the time being. Yeah, back in Dublin. Uh, soon as all this sort of kicked off, the, the manager at, at Salford was good. He said to me, Listen, he knew me, me partner and, and two kids were, were back in Dublin. So he said, get yourself home. So I just jumped on the boat and, and drove home. Literally that day, we were meant to get down to play against Exeter. We were, and that was on the Friday. We were traveling the night before. And he just said, listen, it's not, we're not going to be playing for a while. So you may as well get yourself home. Yeah. Well, are you, are you taking them, uh, making the most of the time being back? Yeah, it's good. I think it's, my little girl, she's, I have two, two little girls and, the oldest one is four, so she she's loving it. She is normally I'm up and out of the house and gone training, and, and then getting back quite late after going to the gym and, and whatnot. So she's loving having me having me free. She's in the room beside me now. It wouldn't surprise me if she'll run in in a few minutes. Well, it's no hassle if she does. Um, but look, we we said uh, we get you on to talk about your career. So uh, we had a couple of issues with Wi Fi and, and iPads and stuff like that. So um, we're a little bit delayed on time, but. Yeah. Let's let's get into it. Growing up as a kid, uh, what are your earliest memories of football? Earliest memories probably just playing for Crumlin. Uh, I played for Crumlin United for for ten years. My dad, he brought me over uh, to play for them when I was five. He did so. He started coaching there at the time as well, which was I loved my time at Crumlin, and I was. It's pretty strange that I played for them since I was five, right up till I was fifteen, till I signed for Celtic. So I had great memories at Crumlin. Uh, obviously, we had a really good team. We are very successful as well at, at schoolboy level. So yeah, I love me. I love me schoolboy years. They were great. They were even me little girl. I, I bring her around to to Pierce Park. I do and um, in the summertime, I brought her around. Me Godchild, he was boxing in Crumlin. He was so. I brought her to show her where I play football when I was when I was smaller, and uh, Martin was there. Martin Lochran was there, and he brought her in, gave her crumbling jerseys, sock shorts, the whole lot. So she she's still wears them now. She does. She loves it. So it's good that I was able to bring her around to show her where I played when I was a kid. Like, yeah, and obviously that's good memories then for the future. And she'll have that that memorabilia with the kits and stuff like that. Um, but just in regards when you when you were kind of before you actually started playing was there a memory there that kind of stuck out that made you went oh I want to be a footballer or I want to start playing football was there a World Cup or, or anything like that no not really my dad my dad was um, he was just a massive influence on me like literally when he, he he's a bricklayer yeah. so literally as soon as he came in from work he used to just have me playing football non-stop um, every day he used to bring me out playing football so that's the, the earliest memory I have is just playing football with my dad out on the road you know what I mean like he, he was great for me. Um, he just non-stop playing football with me. And even now, still, like no matter where I'm playing, he always comes over and watches me play. So he, he, him him playing football with me is, it was my earliest memory. I don't really remember much stuff regarding like like football matches or anything like that. Like n- Nothing like that really sticks in my head, to be honest. Okay, I just I, I always ask that just to kind of get an idea. But who was your favourite player growing up then when, while you were playing? Uh, Roy Kane. I loved love Roy Kane, obviously being a midfielder as well. He was just a massive, massive oil of mine. Um, when I was younger, I was mad Manchester United fan. Like when I was really small, so obviously being a United fan and him being he was the main man there. He was so I loved uh, watching him play. But as I got older, my dad kind of he swayed me to support Birmingham City. He did because he used to bring me over to all the games when I was younger. Um, we had family living in Birmingham. And, and we used to have season tickets, so he used to get me out of school uh, when I when I was in primary, and he used to bring me over to watch the games, which was great. It was because everyone would be stuck in school on a Friday, and he used to just come in and say, "Here, we're, we're going over to watch Birmingham play against whoever it was." So we used to go out for the weekend, and and that was that kind of swayed me away from Man United. Obviously, the glory years it would have been them for them, but. Uh, supporting Birmingham they were in the championship at the time and luckily enough I actually he actually brought me over to watch them when, when they got promoted um, to the Premier League so that was that was great as well so I, I switched to being a Birmingham fan then so I was a bit of a tone call Did you, did you get to uh, meet Keith Fahey at all when you, when you were over there because he would have been at Birmingham when they got promoted 
No, I didn't get to meet him. Well, obviously, I played against him when I was when I when I came back and played for Dundalk, but I never actually got to meet him. Um, it was I'm trying to think who would have played for him then when I went to watch them. Um, I know Darren Carter. He scored the winning penalty in the in the playoff final. Um, that was in Cardiff. Me, me dad brought me. We didn't even have a hotel to stay in. We didn't. Me dad was just like, listen, that I get into the to the playoff final. We're going all for it. So I was only a kid at the time. So. We literally just packed the bags and, and we went over. And I, I'll never forget, we were walking around Cardiff looking for a hotel because obviously with the playoff one, they were all booked out. And then we ended up uh, getting in somewhere. So they, they're, they're good memories that I have from from, from being a, a, a young kid uh, following football. Like. Yeah, I, it, it sounds amazing the fact that your dad's been there the kind of whole way up and you have some, so many good memories and he still comes and watches you play. So... Um, would you say he was probably your biggest influence growing up and in football? Yeah, definitely. There's, obviously, I've had coaches, managers, people like that, that that have had big influences on my career, but no one's had the impact that my dad's had, especially even when I, we'll probably get on to it later on in the conversation, but when I left Celtic and that, and I was falling out of love with football a little bit. He was the one who literally picked me up and gave me the little shake that I needed, like... Yeah, it was always nice to have that because I, I know, uh, and as I said, we, we will get to it in a few minutes, but a lot of people do go abroad, I uh, come back and just stop playing altogether. Obviously, you came back and got back playing and, and that was through him, but it's, it's nice to have that to fall back on. Obviously, your family were there for you when, and through the hard times, but talk me through your kind of your schoolboy years right up until when you signed for Celtic and then signed the pro contract, if you don't mind. Yeah, it was... It's just that crumbling was brilliant. Obviously, at the start we didn't have that good of a side. We didn't um, like we were always toward fourth, like in the leagues. And then I remember John Bulger, Richie Farrell, they they came in and and they took a lot of the Cherry Orchard lads with them. They did over to Crumlin. so they took the likes of Conor Clifford, Andy Boyle, who uh, I played with at Dundalk. Um, obviously, Conor went to Chelsea as well. Not long after that. Uh, Dara Sattel, players like that. So they took all them from Cherry Orchard because Richie Farrell was coaching there and they all came down to play for Crumlin. Um, and as soon as they came in, we just we just wiped the floor with everyone we did. I remember one year, like we had a goalkeeper coming down from Donegal, Gavin Carroll, and he, he ended up signing for West Brom, but he was coming down from Donegal to play for to play for Crumlin like at 14, 15, which is madness when you think about it now. Like, But that's just the mindset that Richie and John had and they just wanted to win so they were just getting the best players from everywhere so as soon as they came in we just won everything we did Um, obviously then I, I ended up playing for Ireland as well because we were winning everything and the scouts used to come and watch us watch us play and the, the Ireland manager used to come and watch so I ended up making my debut for Ireland when I was 15 as well I think against Holland and I think there was like I think there was 8 or 9 that was from the Crumlin team in the Ireland team which was madness when you think was about that, it. Uh, sorry, Richard, was that in Tallis Stadium by any chance? No, it was in it was in Holland because I never forget. Um, my my uncle lives in, in Holland, he does, he lives in Amsterdam. And he came and watched me play, me dad flew over and all to, to watch the game. So it was mental because it was just like playing with all my mates, but I was playing for Ireland because there was like eight or nine of us there was. It was brilliant there was and something that I really enjoyed as well. Yeah, no, the only reason I say that to you about the um, playing Holland is because I remember being at an Ireland under I think it was an under 19 game against Holland in Tallis Dave and uh, Wesley Snyder's brother was playing yeah. I'm pretty sure you were playing on the left hand side with Robbie Brady in that game yeah I probably played left back I did and Robbie probably yeah you did on the left. it was weird I used to play everywhere for Ireland sometimes I'd play right back left back and then obviously I played a lot of centre mid as, as I got a little bit older but I think I think being so young and being able to play in different positions just really helped me throughout my career because you just you just know different parts of the game and you're just learning all the time. So at the time, I remember thinking, "What am I doing playing left back? Like this is this is madness." But as I got older and and you look back, you think, "Yeah, you know what? It actually helped me. It did because you have to you have to adapt and, and and think of different scenarios in the game. You know what I mean? Which is which is good. Like I suppose it improves your, your kind of football brain at the same time as well. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, obviously, me left foot probably wouldn't have been the best. So I had to had to be constantly thinking during the game, right? How can I get this back onto me right foot and, and stuff like that? And and even when you're 
you, you normally tackle with your right foot and if you're playing left back most wingers are going down the line so you're, you're tackling with your opposite foot and stuff like that so yeah just just little things that that i probably i probably kept with me without even without even realizing do you know what i mean yeah, that was just that game stuck with me. I don't know why, but that game always stuck with me. I remember going, my dad got free tickets to that game out in Tala, and we all went. And I just remember yourself and Robbie Brady standing out on the left hand side. I think he was in front of you, but the two years that day were awesome. Yeah, well, Robbie's Robbie's class. I remember, I remember the first time he came into one of the squads. He was obviously a year younger than everyone, and that didn't really happen with a, a younger player coming up at that time. And I remember he came up, and I was thinking. It's a bit strange, and then went out training, and then I just thought, "Who is this fella?" Look, I never, never seen anyone that had feet like him and his pace. He just, he just had everything, and no wonder why he's gone on to have such a good career and, and play so many games in the Premier League. You could see it from an early age, like. Yeah, well, from kind of moving from Crumlin to Celtic, what uh, you were saying there, you were getting noticed being at Ireland games and so on. So, what was uh, the deal breaker that kind of? Made you choose Celtic. It was obviously that Irish link, but in your own words. Yeah, I I went on trial to quite a lot of clubs when I was younger. Like I went to Spurs. I remember I went to Leicester, Nottingham Forest, and to be fair, quite a lot of them offered offered contracts. They did, but then Celtic came in. And I was just like, Celtic is Celtic is Celtic. Do you know what I mean? There's no you don't really need to sell the club. Like it's a massive club. And then when I went over on trial, there was I think at the time there was like. 11 or 12 Irish players that was there like the Graham Curdy, Paul Catalan Paul Skinner um, there were so many players there was so it was just like a home from home obviously I'd been at Crumlin and I was a bit of a obviously I was a home board I'd never been away from home and then when I went over there it was just like like playing with my mates again do you know what I mean and the likes of Skinner i never forget Paul Skinner he was brilliant when I first went over he made me feel really welcome so it was just it was an easy decision, really, like to to sign for Celtic. Just and and I'm glad I did because it was it was probably one of the best decisions I did make. Yeah, Paul Skinner, what a legend! He's now uh, coaching at yeah. Shelburne, but he's he's an absolute gentleman. Yeah, Skinner's great. He is honestly, because obviously he was driving at the time as well, so he used to come and pick me up and and, and like he just does help me out doing everything he did. So I have a lot of time for Skinner. I know he's he's a lovely fella. Yeah, well, talk me through your time at Celtic uh, from your own point of view. Obviously, you went on loan and stuff. So, kind of from when you came in to going to, to Hibs and your time there, in your own words. Yeah, I remember just I remember when I signed. I think they had got beat in the Youth Cup final, like I think five or six nil off Rangers, and that's a massive deal. That is that uh, when you're at Celtic, and because I remember when I got to the Youth Cup final, I think there was like 40,000 at the game or something like that, which is which is crazy for an under, I think it was under 19s at the time. So I remember they had just been beat 5 or 6 nil by Rangers and there was massive changes happening at the club. Um, and then obviously when I went in, I think they got a new manager then in straight away. Um, to be fair, I loved it there. It was As soon as I went in, obviously I was meant to be like under 16, 17, but I was... I was real tenacious and vocal and just typical Dublin young fella. Like thought I was thought I was brilliant at the sign for Celtic and just loving it over there at the time. And obviously I was I was I was really fit at the time as well. So pre season I'd obviously showed showed I had a bit of talent and the manager straight away just put me straight up into doing the nineteens. And I was I was still only fifteen at the time because I was turning sixteen in the July. So I'm trying to think. Yeah. Yeah, I was just turned 16 in July, so he he put me straight into the under 19s, and I felt like this is this is tough because I was playing against the likes of Graham Curdy and and players like that, and there was a lot of Scottish lads that was playing for Scotland at the time as well. So I remember um, going away on a on a pre season trip. We went to it was in Spain somewhere. I'm trying to think now. What's the team that wears the yellow yellow jerseys? The yellow. Villarreal, that's exactly what it was. Yeah, we went to Villarreal and they used to have a mini tournament they did. And I never forget, it was like Real Madrid, Juventus, AC Milan, all these teams were there. There was teams from Japan. And I remember, never forget, they, they put me straight in the team. They did and I, was, I thought I was just going to be going off for a training camp. They stuck me straight in the team. I played right back, I did. And I was flying over there. I never forget, I was like 
it's probably one of the best I've, I've ever played at right back. And straight away, the manager just loved me. He did and since then, he just he just stuck me in the team and never took me out. And that was that was that was brilliant. It was really because like, playing playing for the under nineteen at Celtic at sixteen was was unbelievable for me. Like there was something that I never thought would happen straight away. Because my dad spoke to me and said, like, listen, you're gonna have to bide your time. You want to play sixteen, seventeens, and stuff like that. And then I remember by the end of the season, I was up playing with the reserves and all. I was only about sixteen, turning and seventeen, which was which was great. It was. Yeah, well, obviously your dad must have been really proud of the fact that you, you, you got to deal with Celtic. Was he a big factor in kind of getting you over it? Not really. Like, my dad, my dad just left that up to me, he did, because obviously I had went on trial to Birmingham City as well. And, and Birmingham City offered me a contract. And I was like, obviously, I was oh. at the time, yeah. And I'd been to see so many games and, and stuff like that. And obviously with my dad being a massive fan and my uncle's a massive fan as well. So... I was thinking, oh, he's going to put pressure on me here to sign there. And I didn't want to sign for Birmingham because, as you said, the Orange connection that was at, uh, that was at Celtic, I, I wanted to sign there. And my dad was just like, listen, sign where you want to sign. There's, there's no pressure on you to sign for Birmingham, even even though I support him. Like, it's it's your decision, it's your career, it's, it's your livelihood, basically. So he never put pressure on me. He, he just asked me, where do you want to play? And when I said Celtic, he was like, right, let's do it then. Oh, that's brilliant. So, how did your your um move? Uh, your, sorry, your move to Hibs happen then? I remember I played right back again. I'm seeing seeing have a lot of trends. I playing right back. I played right back against Hibs in a friendly. Um, I think Colin Calderwood. He he was the manager at the time, and he had just taken over, and we we had played a friendly against them, and I played really well playing right back because at Celtic they used to in the reserves. Anyone that didn't play on a Saturday for the first game used to play for the reserves on whatever it was, Tuesday or Wednesday. So I remember we had the likes of Mark Crossas and Thomas Gravison and that. They, they were playing centre midfield. So I was thinking, I'm never going to get a chance of playing here. But they ended up putting me right back and uh, I played well. Literally, that was, I think that was on a Wednesday. And then there was talk about it. Neil Lennon pulled me into the office on, on tours and was like, listen, do you want to go to Hibs? So I was like, yeah, let's, let's go. Hibs are a massive club. Like, I don't think I realised how big of a club they were until I actually went. Um, so I went went to Hibs on, that was on the tour state. Went to Hibs, trained with them on Friday and then played against Rangers on Saturday. So it, they started again against Rangers at right back and I was thinking, fucking hell, this man. So I didn't know any any of the lads' names. Like I was looking on the back of their jerseys and trying to see what their names were and all. It was, it was weird, it was, but it was a great experience at Hibs. Well, what, what was it like being kind of Drafted in, as you say, and then, like, you're, what age were you at that point? I think I was 18, 18 or 19, because I just made my debut for Celtic. And I forget, I made my debut a couple of weeks before that. Uh, I remember Scott Brown was out injured, and there was good midfielders at Celtic at the time then. There was, like, Victor Wanyama, um, there was Ki Sung Young, who was, it was at Newcastle, Um Joe Ledley was there at the time. Uh, Brownie was there, so there was there was really good players there. So I was thinking, I'm never gonna play here. Like it was it was it was frustrating because I was doing really well in the reserves every week, and there was a few teams wanted to take me on loan. So I was thinking, I need to I need to get out and play. And then one of the games I was out warming up against Inverness, and I remember it was like me. I think it could have been Victor Wanyam and George Samaras were out warming up, and he, Neil Lennon was like. Let's go. And I was like looking around thinking, right, lads, he wants you. I was like, so the two other lads are like, and they're like, no. And I was like, hey, I was like, what? And he was like, yeah. So I never forget. I was just like, as soon as he said me, my legs started shaking. I was like, what is going on here? It was like 50,000 at the game. And I think it was nil nil at the time. And I just remember being so nervous going on. My mouth went right straight away. But I went got on and made a couple of nice passes and then I set up Paddy McCourt for, for his goal and then I just felt so relaxed after that. It was it was unbelievable. I never forget like my phone was hopping off off the walls for, for the rest of the night. Um and then it was I didn't play them for like I think two or three weeks and obviously I was quite I was a bit hot headed back then. I was I was thinking, why am I not playing here? Like this is a joke, even though I had like 
one yam and Scott Brown was back from injury. I was, I was thinking, I should be playing. So I went into his office. I was like, I want to go out on loan. And he just said, get out of my office. <laughs> Sent me straight out of his office and Neil Lennon did straight away. So I was thinking, shit, that didn't go with the plan. And then I think he, I think he actually quite liked the fact that I'd done that because he's seen how much I wanted to play at such a young age. So then after the Hibs game, when I played against them, he called me in and said, listen, I know you want to play. I wouldn't let you go out on loan to, to some of the other clubs, but Hibs are a massive club. And he knew Colin Calderwood was was a really good man and, and a good manager. So he was like, what do you think? And I was like, straight away, I said, yeah, I want to go. And he, I'm out, never forget, he said to me, do you not want to have a think about it? And I was like, no, I want to go. And he was like, right. He said, if you sign by tomorrow, you're going to play against Rangers on Saturday. So literally, I'm out, never forget, I left the training ground, went straight up and signed for Hibs on loan, which is it's crazy when you think about it now, like. Yeah, well, I suppose it must be great for you, kind of, to think back, uh, uh, to bring you back to that exact moment. Like, yeah, it's crazy. That's what I'm saying. When I think about it now, like, it's only sometimes when you actually take time to reflect on what has happened in your career that you actually appreciate what you did do. Like, because as I said, I was only about eighteen or nineteen, making me debut for Celtic. If I had a little boy that that someone said to me he's gonna play for Celtic when he's eighteen, nineteen. I just I'd never believe it, like you know what I mean. So to know that I've that I've actually played for Celtic is is something that I'll I'll always cherish. Yeah, well, hundred percent, and and you definitely should. But onto your kind of loan spell at, at Hibs, then. So you were kind of going into Hibs, flying basically, uh, doing well at Celtic. You're just at the making your debut. So what was the time at Hibs like? I lo- I love my time at Hibs. Hibs is a brilliant club and a massive club. Like we used to get full house every week and. I remember when I signed, it was, they were struggling at the time. They were, I think they could have been in the relegation zone maybe. So there was a lot of pressure going there at the time because, as I said, I was only, well, probably 19. And I was probably after being sheltered a little bit, always like being at Crumlin, we won everything. Being at Celtic in the youth team, we won everything. And then going to Hibs, who was in a relegation battle, it was a real eye opener, it was because. Every week there was a lot of pressure on us. Like I remember, like if you made a bad cross or something like that, the fans would be on you because there was a lot riding on on the games at the time. So that that was it was hard, but I loved it. Like I never shied away from it, and I loved playing every week. And like even Colin Calderwood, he was he was the manager then. He was he like he just threw me in at the deep end, and and I had a lot of respect for him for that. You know what I mean? Because he, he put a lot of trust in me. And to be fair, we ended up I think. I remember when I first went, I think we won like six in a row, something like that. And I think out of 10, I think we had only been beating them one game in 10. So I remember we, we shot straight up the table and the fans started to take a liking to the team again. So once the Hibs fans get in, get back on your side, it's 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 a good place to play. Like. And what were you playing right back there, centre mid, or, or where were you playing? Yeah, I was playing right back. I played right back quite a lot. I'd say probably 80% of the games I played right back. And then when we used to play like games and train and I used to play midfield all the time and he used to be like, what are you doing? Like, go and play right back. I was like, I'm not a right back. I used to say like, like when I played for Selden that game, I only played right back because two first team players were, were down to play centre midfield. I'm normally a centre midfielder. So Colin was great with me then at the time. He he stuck me in midfield for, for a few games to see how I do. And, and I remember playing really well. And then the following season, he, he, he liked it. So he, he, he asked, could he have me for another season on loan? So talk me through that season then. Was Neil Lennon reluctant to let you go? I don't know. Well, obviously, there was, there's a lot of pressure on, on on him to win leagues at Celtic. And obviously, with the players that he had there, like he probably knew that I wasn't going to play. Like, And I was being realistic as well because, as I said, the, the players that was there, like Wanyama and stuff, he was probably only about a year older than me, so we probably thought we have two players very similar age, so we probably thought they'd keep one yam and let me go out on loan to get some game time. So I'd done the whole of pre-season with Celtic, and then after that we played them first game of the Celtic, Hibs first game of the season, and I was in the stand I was, and I remember going up to going up to Edinburgh and, and, and sitting in the stand, and it was good to be back there, it was, um, at, at the Hibs Stadium. It's, it's a great stadium it is, and um, 
and then obviously it was after the game the two managers had obviously obviously spoken um and then i went out on loan probably about three or four days later and so how was the, how did that season go for you it was brilliant i loved the up to a certain point i loved it up until calderwood colin calderwood ended up leaving then um i think it would have been around probably around the christmas mark um he left or else he got the sack maybe i think he probably could have got the sack actually and um, obviously new manager came in oh, i played every game up to that playing right back centre midfield uh, i played right mid a couple of times and, and was loving it again playing every week i was only probably 19 or 20 by this stage playing every week for hibs um new manager came in didn't play me so ended up hating it like literally like didn't want to play football anymore so that was that was a bit of a frustrating time like you go back to celtic how uh how did you end up leaving celtic then yeah it was it was a bit ruthless the way they done it i didn't even go back to celtic obviously i was out on loan at hibs and my contract was up at the end of the year so obviously with not having played for for the last half of the season being out of contract probably not being the best professional i could have been like there was no teams like wanting me over in Scotland and Celtic obviously they weren't renewing my contract so I think my agent at the time he got an email to say that they weren't renewing my contract and then basically he just forwarded on to me and I was like what the fuck is this like basically I was thinking what's going on here um, so yeah they just they just released me and at the time I was thinking I don't even care like you know what I mean I'll I'd fallen out of love with football after not playing for probably four or five months. I was thinking, I don't really care. Like, I'll just go home. And then I, I came back here. And even before I signed for Dundalk, I was, i never forget, was, I was up playing for, for Bluebell. Um, Andy Noon and Trevor Malloy, they were, they were at Bluebell at the time. And one of my mates, Fitzer, he was, he was playing for them at the time. So we used to go to the gym with him every day. And... He was like to me, why don't you not come up for a kick about it? And I was like, I can't be bothered really. Like, I don't really want to go up and play. I didn't really want to play football anymore. So I never forget, my dad sat me down and he was like, listen, this isn't you. He was like, like we, I know you have the talent to do it, but you just need to apply yourself better. So we, we had like a, a big heart-to-heart -heart discussion. Um, and I said, right. Obviously, I'm not going to, I just said, right, I'm not going to go out anymore. I'm not going to drink. I'm going to try and eat as healthy as I can. And I'm going to go to the gym every day. And they were probably four things that I hadn't taken seriously in my, in my career up to then. Because obviously, I was a kid. I was living on my own in Edinburgh. Um, obviously, I probably wasn't the best cook at the time. I didn't have my mom and dad there to cook for me. So I was going out with all the lads every weekend and stuff like that. So I probably wasn't the best best preparation for games and for training so I said right I'm gonna knock all that on the head and I'll just give it a year because I'd, I'd been going out to walk with me dad like he's he's a bricklayer he is so I'd been going out to walk with him and I was thinking fuck that I don't want to be doing that every day like that's that's how graph that is so I was thinking oh, I don't want to do this anymore I was like what am I gonna do I remember looking at like barbering courses and stuff like that and I was thinking I might have to do something to earn money like so my dad said, listen, before you do anything, give it give it one more year, um, see what you think. So I'd end up, he, he made me go up and train with Bluebell. I was like, I'm not going up to train up there. I don't want to. And he was like, no, you're going up. Like, And then I went up and Andy and Trevor were brilliant. They were, um, they, they, it was just like, like, it was like me being back at Crumlin when I was a kid. So I was just like playing football with me, with, with me mates again. Because obviously all the lads were having the crack they were. And, uh, and I, I loved it. I played with them for a couple of months, I did. Um, and then obviously the likes of Pats and Rovers and Dundalk came to watch me play while I was there because I was doing I was doing all right like getting back in the swing of things I was starting to love it again and uh, I went I think I went to yeah I went to meet Stephen Kenny in in the hotel in Inchicore because it was only down the road for me so I went down there and I had had a cup of tea with Stephen and then then I came back and I was like I don't think I want to go up to Dundalk like they had they had just stayed up through. A relegation playoff I think at the time so I was thinking I don't really want to sign there um, like I'd rather go to Rovers or Pats or but I wanted to sign for Pats at the time because it was literally a stone's throw for me out so I was like I want to sign for Pats but they ended up I don't think they wanted me in the end so I was like alright fair enough like that's 
whatever whatever they they felt and I knew who was playing for them at the time and I was thinking, oh, I'm bad them, like you know what I mean? But uh Liam Buckley he, he didn't want to sign me, so I ended up going up signing for Dundalk and I was thinking, right, I need to get me my head down now and to be fair I, I never forget, like I met Graham Bourne, he was just he just came in as a strength and conditioning coach at Dundalk and he basically changed everything he did. Like I definitely wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for him. He had he had a massive influence uh, on my career because he used to like just wake up, fucking eat cocoa pops and chicken fillet rolls, like not like just like eating too much pasta and like not eating the right thing. He he gave us big chats on nutrition and and obviously the strength and conditioning side of it and. Basically, he used to give us programs every day, and I used to just follow it to a T. Like I, like I wouldn't skip a rep. I wouldn't like I would I'd just do everything what he told me to do. And then I ended up seeing massive changes in my body and and stuff like that. And I remember him doing bleep tests. I think it was after a couple of maybe about a month or two. And I remember the the bleep test stopped. Like the the recording had finished, and I was still running like I was like. Phew. This is this is easy, like you know. What I mean, I felt great, and even in the games, then I felt great because I was finding, like, in the last twenty minutes, like everyone was getting tired. They were because before I, some of the lads were walking as well that I was playing against. You know what I mean? So they were they were going out walking. Like we had spoke about Dan Massey earlier. Like he was when I first signed for them, he was he was still walking as a sparks. He was so he used to finish walk. He'd be still in the Snickers and all coming up to meet us at the Red Cow. So we'd go up to Dundalk. So I knew that lads were out walking hard but after and I was literally like waking up and going to the gym and living like a professional athlete should so I'll never forget the last 20 minutes I always knew that I had something extra inside that I was just fair and stronger than everyone else that I could like get into the box and people wouldn't track me and stuff like that so as I said Graham Graham was great for that he was like he really helped me a lot So you, you hold it obviously to Graham for this, the work he's doing with you then yeah, Graham's brilliant. Even now, like, like I was only talking to Graham this morning. Like, he's Graham's brilliant. He is like, and he's someone that that is really close to me now. Like, I'm gonna have him as one of my groomsmen in my wedding and all. Like, that's how that's how close we ended up getting. Do you know what I mean? Like, so as I said, I owe I owe Graham a lot. Like, well, congrats on on the wedding. Hope that it all goes well. That's that's cancelled now. <laughs> Partners in next door. She is she. She's raging. She is so obviously with all this happening, we had to postpone. It was meant to be in June, so so that's how that happened to be postponed till next year. So yeah, it's madness. Oh, okay, well I hope it all goes well then. Then, uh, but Stephen Kenny, what was he like to you? Because I know um, you were saying there about yourself really benefiting, but what was he like as a manager? He's now Ireland manager, so can you gonna give an insight to what he's like as a man manager? Yeah, as as I said earlier, like about my dad having the biggest influence on me obviously because he's he's been there since day one but manager was Stephen has definitely had the biggest impact in my career like um just just the way he, he thinks different to every other manager like like I remember like when when we met up forced like he was talking about winning the league and stuff like that and I was thinking is he mad like where like like the lads have just stayed up to a relegation playoff and he's talking about going and win the league now and I was thinking he's nuts but then after a few weeks like I seen the players that he signed he signed the likes of Keith Ward Stevie O'Donnell Andy Boyle uh, Dan like there was loads of good players there John Garth. Sullivan yeah Garth he saw, Garth signed a little bit later on in, in the year because he was at the been playing up the north I think so he had signed a little bit later on Um, but I remember thinking that when I was trying I was thinking these players are like really good. Like I, like I, I wasn't, I didn't really know too much about the standard of League of Ireland, but I was thinking like, like these are these are top players here. So we played Rovers' first game of the season, and I think they were one of the favourites to win it. They had signed a lot of players, and we drew with them nil nil. And I remember being raging coming off the pitch. Like the Dundalk fans cheered as if we had won the league when when we drew nil nil with Rovers, but we had battered them on the night. We had we should we should have easily beat them, but. But we didn't, and I remember thinking after that game, if they're the favourites, one of the favourites to win it, like we actually do have a chance if we can play like this every week. So Stephen just he just installed that in us straight away. He was like, "Listen, we're good enough to win it." He was like, "If we stick together, 
and basically listen to what I tell you to do, we'll do well. And we ended up finishing second that year, which Pats won it, but Pats deserved to win it. Pats, Pats were the best team that year. But I knew, like, with the players that he was talking about signing and stuff like that, it was obvious that, that we were going to go on to bigger and better things then. As you did then. Um, so, what was it like? Because you're saying there that, you know, you, he's there talking about winning the league and then you finished second. You're going into the next season and going quietly confident. Yeah, like th- obviously we had signed a lot of good players then in in the I was gonna say in the summer it was obviously in the winter at that stage so we had signed a lot of good players we had and I knew straight away I was like yeah, we're gonna win it this year like we had s- signed like some Ronan and Finn and I don't know maybe Finn I came the year after that I'm not sure um but we I remember we had made a lot of good signings and I was thinking yeah we definitely have enough enough to win the league and then I think our first game I think we got beat off draw they like four or five nil or something four or five one or four or five nil no I was thinking oh what is going on here this like this cannot happen because like draw the weren't weren't favourites to win or anything like that and that was a big rivalry for us so I remember thinking what is going on here like but after that I think we won like 12 or 13 on the bounce and you could see like the football we are playing like he Stephen was like great with that joint training and that like he would map out how to win a game where they were weak and we just walk on it all, all during the week and I always I always walked at the weekends like and obviously he put my he made he made you feel like you were the best player in the world. That's that's the way Stephen made you feel. I'm sure you've had other lads on on the show that have walked with Stephen and he, he just goes around individually and by the time he's finished speaking with you you think I can do anything on the pitch like you know what I mean it's it's, it's a good feeling that he makes you have. Yeah well, uh, I've spoken to a lot of you know, Dundalk players and a couple of the under twenty one players, they do say that. But they do say the way he kinda his approach to training is quite different, uh, in, in a good way, like and he, he exploits the weaknesses of the opposition's team, as you said. Yeah, and something that I loved with Stephen as well, like obviously he does he does go into detail on the other team, but more so he concentrates on his own team. So like he wouldn't care if he thought a team was was a better team than the so I remember when we went to play Bate Borisov and they were like good pedigree team, like they'd been in the Champions League group stages and stuff like that. And I remember before the game he was like, No, we're gonna dominate the ball in the game and he was like, We're gonna play out from the back. Because most teams like in Ireland, if they if they play against a team like that, they they play a little bit longer, they sit behind the ball and they just try and get anything they can from the game. But I remember going over, we played Bate over there in the first leg. Um, we must have had like 60-70% possession of the ball like we are literally we just kept the ball off him for the whole game and after the game I remember thinking that that's like like we didn't believe in it well I, I remember going out to the game and I was thinking no we need to just keep it tight here and, and hopefully we can catch them on the break but he was just like no nah, that's not going to happen we're going to dominate the ball obviously he'd watch a lot of clips on them he was like we're going to dominate the ball and we're going to take the game to them and, and we did we did do that and that's probably the type of manager that he is. He's he's just like he doesn't care about other teams. He just he just focuses on his own team and, and he, he really believes in them, which is which is something that I think he'll bring into the, the into the Orleans so. Yeah, well just just describe the um the European run with the dock there, because it's obviously a great time in your career. Yeah, it was brilliant. I remember I remember the fourth the fourth game we played in Luxembourg, we played against a team called I think Yenisesk or something like that. They they had won the, the the league in Luxembourg and we went over to play against them. That I think it would have been the Europa League qualifier at the time. And obviously I'd scored a good few goals leading up to that game. And I was thinking everyone was saying, Oh, there's like a bit of pressure on us to go over and win because we had been playing so well. So we went over. I think we beat them four 0 away from home. I remember scoring, I think I scored two or three in, in, in the first game. And it was just like, like after that game, we were just like, we're, we're a proper team here. Like so, we knew that we had the players to to go over anywhere and beat them. And and obviously we had Stephen and Vinnie Pierce, who who was now the Dundalk manager. They were they were just like unbelievable at, at the way they they went through every detail. And I think that's what gave us the little edge over everyone. We were a little bit more professional than the other sides. Yeah, but is because I always re- remember the Shells team. You know, going away to Deportivo and stuff like that, and then there's obviously that 
the Rovers team went away, we played Spurs and stuff like that. But you, the Dundalk team is definitely in that bracket with the Shells and Rovers at that time. And it's a historic time in Irish football when, when Dundalk did that. But you mentioned there, obviously, about Stephen not being afraid to play against uh, other teams. I think that's exciting for, for Irish fans for the future as well. Because, as you mentioned as well, about Irish teams going away, even at League of Ireland, but the actual national team, when they go somewhere where they're not favourites, they kind of shell away a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's strange. It's, it's, it's a poor mentality when you think about it. Like, like, you all, like for Irish teams, you always think like oh, inferior, but like, we're not. Like, we're a good football nation. We are. And we should be proud of, of, of the teams that we have. So I'm sure Stephen will, will bring that back out in, in Irish football. He'll make everybody be, be proud to support Ireland and, and be proud to play for Ireland. And I've no doubt that he, he, he's definitely going to get the best out, out of the current team. Like, yeah, well, what was it? What was it like? You know, the games against Hadrick Split, Sparta, and stuff for you, because from nearly quitting football, never playing it again, to be one of the most historic teams in Irish football history, especially in Europe. Um, so, talk me through that kind of transition for you. Yeah, it was it was strange. It's actually probably one of the biggest factors in how my career went from being where it was what to obviously how I ended up being at Dundalk. I came home, it was after maybe two or three games of the second season, and I came home from, from playing Sligo when we had won, and, and my partner, I used to go back to my partner's house, and it was maybe 11 o'clock at night by the time we'd get home from Dundalk, and she said to me, do you want to go out for a walk? And I was thinking, I'm shattered here. Like, you know, like asked me to go out for a walk at like half 11 at night. And then when, when we went out for a walk, she she had the pregnancy test in her in her pocket and, and she showed it to me. And to be fair, like, I feel even a bit emotional now about it. Like, um, the two of us were, were over the moon. We were, obviously, I was quite young at the time and playing at the dock. And I was thinking, oh, something needs to change here. Like, I want to have the best life possible for my family. So... I was like, I really need to knuckle down now, like, and and start hitting, hitting the highest that I know I can. So, I never, I hadn't even, I think I'd scored one goal after like five or six games, and then when 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 she told me the news that we we're we we're having a baby that season, I ended up scoring twenty nine goals, which is like mental it was. So, I think think finding out that news really gave me like the proper kick of the arse that I needed, like. Yeah, well, you were, you know, and that was from midfield. You were getting those goals. The best player in the country, obviously, that season as well. Yeah, it was. That's what I, and I had a bet with Vinnie Pearce because the season before I had scored, I think I'd scored maybe 12 or 14 goals. And I remember thinking, I have missed way too many chances. Like, I, like every game I was getting in good goal scoring positions, like, I should have had at least. 20 goals that season and I kept I kept being wasteful and probably with scoring every every three games I was probably happy enough with that but then I was thinking now I need to I need to be better like like as soon as she told me that I was like I can't be wasting opportunities just because I knew I could get a lot more goals and I never forget after like that five or six games I had scored probably one goal and I had a bet with Vinnie Peart Vinnie I was like I could easily get I said I could easily get 20 goals from midfield and he was like, no chance. He was like, no midfield, I can get 20 goals from midfield. And I was like, no, I, I genuinely could. And he was like, right, well, if you get 20 goals, he said, I'll pay for you and your missus to go and stay in Powers Court for the weekend at the hotel. And I was like, yeah, that sounds like a fair enough deal. So I never forgot after about, I think I'd scored probably 10, 11 games in a row then. And he was starting to panic a little bit. And uh, <laughs> Then I, I obviously ended up getting the 20 goals and I still had about 10, 12 games left. So there was a big thing in the paper about it. I said, oh, the only reason I wanted to score so many goals was because Vinny was getting me a weekend away in Powers Court. And he, um, the manager of Powers Court Hotel ended up contacting Vinny and saying, listen, we seen the, the spread in the paper. We'll, we'll put them up in the in the hotel free of charge. So he ended up getting away with it. He actually should still, he actually should still get me a weekend away. But I'll never forget, they, they put me and, me and my partner and we had our little girl at the time up in the presidential suite in Powers Park and it was like fucking bigger than my house it was. Like I'd never seen that. And like it like had sauna steam room in, in the rooms and that. 
it was unbelievable. So that probably spurred me on a little bit as well to prove him wrong. Well, that was a lovely touch that they they brought you in then as well to spend it obviously with the, the three of his. Yeah, it was brilliant. It was, and obviously then Vinny not having to pay for the he was probably buzzing as well. He was. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, obviously he's gone on now to be the manager there. Did you expect that to happen? Yeah, probably. It's probably a natural progression because if you change too much, like Dundalk, like they've been a force for, for years. Even like, I know, I forget, like obviously I left Pat Holman, left obviously, he went back Daryl Horgan, Andy Boyle. So there's been a lot of change with players, but the consistency has been the management staff. And obviously, Stephen had it down to a T preparation, how they'd win the games, and Vinny obviously had learned off him. And you could see, you could see Vinny was was always ready to to step up to be a manager. Um, obviously nobody expected it to happen the way it did, but as soon as he he got in charge, you could see his qualities as a manager as well. And they went on to to win the league, and obviously then they they had good runs in Europe as well, which they narrowly missed out on. Yeah, well, hopefully they'll get a chance to do something in Europe. I don't know what way that's going to work this season, but uh, yeah. I'm sure you would really enjoy your, your time at Dundalk. But moving on to Brighton then, how did the move to Brighton come about? Obviously, I had scored, what, twenty? I think 29 goals that year. Um, and my partner, actually, she was just due the baby she was um, in the December so they wanted me to sign in December, even though I couldn't play till January. And there was after being talk of going to a lot of clubs, and I was like, not really interested. I, I was, I, I loved that Dundalk. Like I, like that was like my home. I was like, I, I was playing every week. Fans loved me. I was scoring a lot of goals. We were getting to play in Europe, so I was thinking. I don't really want to go. Like, you know, like I want to stay here. And obviously, with my partner been been due with the baby in December, I was like, I'm gonna have to move away and stuff like that. So I was thinking, I don't really want to do it. And then Brighton came in, and and I didn't really. I, I'm gonna be honest. I didn't really know much about Brighton at the time. Like, they were they they were second in the championship. They were and um, they were like, basically, do you wanna do you wanna come over and play here? And I was like, nah, I, I don't want to go. Like. Graham Barrett, he looks after me, and I was like, I don't want to go. And he said to me, listen, they're at the booking flights, go over, have a look at the place, and see what you think of it. So I was like, yeah, all right, all right, go on, I'll, I'll go over and just have a look around the place and, and see what it's like. Um, obviously, my partner, she couldn't come with me because she was still with a baby, like I think two weeks later. So she couldn't come, so my dad came over with me. And as we are, we flew into London, and as we are driving down, um, Barra said to me, he was like, "Listen, this is, this setup is unbelievable here. Like, like you can't waste this opportunity." And I was thinking, "Yeah, like I was at Celtic and Hibs, like they they had unbelievable setups as well. So like, it's nothing I haven't seen." And then I pulled into the training ground, and I was just like, "This is mental!" Like I couldn't believe the setup at Brighton. Like I don't know if you know about it yourself, but I haven't seen set- it now. Not up close. The setup at Brighton is like incredible. Like they have unlimited pitches big dome indoor the gym is incredible like sauna steam room hydro pools they have everything and i remember getting shown around and it was colin calderwood he 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 showed me around the 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 the, the, the training ground um and obviously having a familiar face that i knew and someone that i liked he showed me around and i was thinking i was getting a bit of a good feel about it then i me and my dad went up and we were having lunch up in the canteen and I turned to me down and I said, Bah, oh, I have to sign here. Like this is incredible. Like they brought the chef out to see me. Lottie, she was she was the chef there at the time. And they brought her out and she was like, Listen, if you need any special dietary requirements, just come and see me. Like I'll look after you. If you need me to cook food for you to bring it home to your house and all. So I was like, This is unbelievable set up here. So I ended up saying to me, Da, I have to sign here. Like I cannot like go back and not not take this opportunity so I um I ended up flying home and Graham Barrett and, and the club obviously negotiating and then a couple of days later I flew back over and I, they actually they actually played against Birmingham City the game they brought me over to sign they played against Birmingham City and they battered them like I mean like I think it was 3 or 4 nil, but like they just kept the ball away from Birmingham the whole game and I was thinking 
oh, I could definitely play here. Like this is this is a good environment. Like obviously with the new stadium, the owner was brilliant, Tony Bloom. He was he was unbelievable. Like he put me and me that in his like executive suite up at the up at the stadium and we had dinner. Um I'm trying to think it was there was like fam- all famous old footballers that was on our table and my dad was waffling the ears after me was and it's just like I just couldn't believe the self that was there. So I was thinking, yeah, this is this is a good place to play. Like, you must have mixed emotions when they were playing against Birmingham. Yeah, it was weird because obviously me and my dad supporting Birmingham, like Brian was battering them. They were, and I, my dad was like, "Fuck, sake, what's going on here?" Like, but, but as I said, like he he was obviously he was he didn't realize how good Brighton were either at the time, and, and when he was watching them play, he was just like these are a serious side like and you can see obviously we narrowly missed out on getting promoted that year but you could see why they got promoted because the setup they had the manager they had and and the way that the, the club was trying to move forward like yeah well who was managing at that time chris Hutton. yeah chris Hutton was the manager so he was brilliant like he he's an unbelievable manager as well um yeah he, he's had a big influence on, on my career and he, he's it, it, the thing I like best about Chris was he never he never treated anyone different. Like obviously I didn't play that much when I was at Brighton, so that was very frustrating for me. But he never treated me any different to the way he treated like Anthony Knockhart or or Lewis Dunk or something like that. He treats everyone the exact same, and that's something that that I really liked about uh, the way Chris walked. And obviously just learning from him as well, like the amount of because obviously I wasn't playing, so I was like even at half time or after the game, I used to always try and be in the dressing room just to hear what he had to say, just to try and to try and pick up little pointers, like if he wanted the midfield to do something different or or anything like that. So, uh, as I said, it's someone that I learned a lot from as well. And you obviously had Shane Duffy there as a teammate. He, he must have been good to have around the place with you. Yeah, Big Duffy, he signed, he signed a while after me, I think. I can't remember, but I, I I was already there and and I had made a lot. Of he friends, saw, he so signed after he signed after the Euros. Yeah, so I think it would have been like I think I was already there maybe six or seven months at the time. I never forget the first time he came into the canteen. He was he was so nervous. I don't know why he was nervous because obviously he, he played for Blackburn with a lot of players. But as it is, it's a bit nerve wracking when you go to a new club and. I never guess Steve Sidwell went up just to say hello to him and City went to shake his hand and Duff like clattered his hand and City was like, fucking hell, calm down, big man. He was just <laughs> nervous. He was like, I don't even know why I done that. Like it was mad. But yeah, having Big Duff there was great. And um obviously we me and Duff knew each other since we were under six days at Ireland. So for him to have me there was probably a little bit easier. Because it just made him settle down a little bit more. And we used to go out for dinner and stuff like that. And he has two kids that were similar age to my little girl. So it was quite easy. And it was just good good from that that, that I was there. And obviously, then I had, I had another mate coming in. And he made a massive difference to the team as well. Like, when he came in, it was just like him and Donkey just shut up shop they did. And that was a big factor in how we got promoted. Like, yeah, well, how was it for yourself? Because I know you said that you didn't play as much. So, why is it you think you weren't playing? Was it just kind of timing and look? Probably the players that was there. Like, Chris didn't change his formation, or he didn't change his setup that often. Like, like he didn't he didn't like swapping and changing players or rotating players. Like, so there was Dale Stevens and Biram Kyle. Um, the both of them were there, and the the. The year that I signed for them, that was obviously in the, excuse me, in the December. Like at the end of the year, they got both of them got in championship team of the year. So it shows how good, how good they actually were. Um, obviously, for me it was very strange because I wanted to play. Like, but I understood that the two boys were just they were just ripping it up every week. They were so I knew that that I had to be patient and if I did get the chance, I'd just have to be ready. And I think I think the likes of. Chris and the and the the coaching staff they they seen how much extra work I done and I think they appreciated that um from me I was always a good professional and, and good around the place and normally when players aren't playing they they feel a bit sorry for themselves but I was after having that at Celtic and after having that at Hibs so it was something that made me think now I'm not gonna let that happen again where I fall out of love with football 
because I'm not playing, do you know what I mean? So I was trying to just keep it in my own hands and, and try and keep myself motivated just that if I did have, what if I was called upon that I was ready, like. Yeah, because you, you obviously made your debut in the FA Cup and then you scored then as well. So those types of things, I think when you were given a chance, you did shine at times. Yeah, like I'll never forget, my first game was against Hull in, in the FA Cup and I played, I ended up playing like right midfield kind of and Andy Robertson played left back and Hardy Maguire played left centre half. And I remember after the game thinking, fucking hell, man, if this is the standard of the championship, like, this is going to be tough. Like, I remember thinking, like, I'm going to have to fucking really knuckle down here, like, and, and improve even more. But obviously, then you see the likes of Andy Robertson. <laughs> He's gone on to win the Champions League and play for Liverpool. And Harry Maguire is one of the most expensive centre-halves in the world now. So probably I was a bit unlucky at the, the game that I got thrown in at the deep end, like, playing against them two, playing right midfield. But... It was uh, it was a good experience. My dad came over to watch that game as well, so he's uh, he never misses the game. So it was good to have him there for my debut. Yeah, that's class. I'd say he was very proud as well. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Well, kind of on on then your Brighton career. Then when was it you decided that you wanted to go out on loan? You just not get enough game time. Similar to Celtic, you just said you want to go on out loan. Was that how it happened? Yeah, well, I we went back for, for one of the pre-seasons. And I remember thinking, right, like, this is my time to shine. Like, like I'm going to be, like, really fit going back. And I didn't really take a break in the off-season. Like, I just non-stop running in the gym. I was out with Graham Bourne, like, like nearly every day, like, walking out with him. And then I remember thinking, right, I'm going to go back, hit the ground, run and we went in and done all like the fitness test. They used to have like a it was like an Iron Man competition they used to have at Brighton during pre season. And I remember I like won that like us like they had like little leaderboard at the end of it. And I remember being top of the leaderboard and I was like, right, I'm buzzing with that, like I'm I'm ready to hit the ground running and I think it was we had played we'd been away on pre season in, in Tenerife or Austria at one of them places and I was feeling really good. But my knee was sore and I was like, something wrong with my knee. But I didn't want to go in and say, oh, here, my knee is, is sore and they'd keep me out for a week or two. Because as I said, I was really fit and I didn't think I had that luxury to to not be in the manager's eye line, do you know what I mean? So I was thinking, right, I need to I need to just manage my knee and just like try and blank it out, basically. basically. And then the day before the, the first pre-season game, I went into the physio and I was like, what do you think of me and And he was like, it was like a balloon, like genuinely it just blown up a hat. And he was like, oh, you need to you need to go and get a scan on that. So I went and got a scan on my knee. And I was out shopping with, with Mrs. And, and the little one. And he said, do you want the good news or the bad news? And I was like, go on, tell me the bad news. And he was like, you might need an operation on your knee. He was like, you have basically had a hole at the back of my knee. And he was like, if if you get an operation, you're going to be out for 10 months. And I was just like, I oh, was the straw. I couldn't believe it. I was thinking, fucking hell, this is like me time to shine. Like I'd gone back super fit, stuff like that. And now he's telling me that I could be out for 10 months. And I was like, what's the good news? And he was like, the good news is you can try and let it heal naturally. Um, and maybe after three months that you might be able to get back training so I was like I'm not getting an operation like that was that was a no-go for me to be out for 10 months I was like no chance so I just ended up managing it and I think I was back after about two months my knee was fully healed and I was I was back flying then and it just took me a while to get back into the swing of things we've been out for, I'd never been out for that long in me in my life like the longest I'd been out for is like a day or two so trying to get back into it was tough and the lads were winning every week they were top of the league so I was like I'm struggling here so I wanted to go out on loan straight away then like when I came back into January Rotherham they wanted to take me on loan they were in the championship at the time but Christian was like nah you're not going anywhere and I was like I'm not playing like why, like, why will you not let me go like I'm, I'm being wasted here like and he was like listen I'm going to be selfish Um, we have one goal that's to get promoted to the Premier League and and I need everybody to do that. And I was thinking, right, so I just took a little step back and I tried to see it from his point of view. So he said, I know I can trust you. 
that if I do need you to, to play, that I know I can put you straight in and you can do a job for me. So I was thinking, all right, and obviously the lads that was playing every week, they they, they didn't get injured. They were they were fighting for the rest of the season. And we ended up getting promoted to the Premier League. So, so being a part of that, I'm actually, Rotherham got relegated and Brighton ended up getting promoted. So I was quite glad that I didn't, I didn't go out on loan. Then looking back on it now, um, being promoted to the Premier League was unbelievable just to be a part of that, like just the celebrations, everything was unreal. Yeah, and you look at how, how much of it's been a massive part for the club now, and they're bringing in lots of young players and everything there. So you're obviously a massive part of them, a part of history there. Yeah, it's, as I said, like when I'm finished playing football, nobody nobody can take them things away from you. Although I didn't I didn't play as much as I would have liked, but it's still I was still there when the club got promoted to the Premier League. So being able to Hopefully, I have a little boy sometime, and, and I can tell him. Listen, I was part of the team that got promoted to the Premier League. Do you know what I mean? So it's it's another good thing that I have to, uh, in my career. Yeah, well, you went you went on on loan then the following season. Uh, was Chris Hewton, He was more, a bit more lenient then, I suppose, letting you go to rather of them, was it? Yeah, well, obviously we we had got promoted to the Premier League, and I think one of the four signings was Davy Proper. He was a Dutch international. They paid about twenty million for him, so. The club was moving, was moving on. It was so I knew I had no chance of playing. Like I'm, I'm, I'm a realist at the end of the day. So I knew I hadn't, hadn't really got a chance of playing. So he was like, "Listen, you can go out on loan." Rodrum had got relegated to League One, and their manager, uh, Paul Warren, he was, he's incredible. Like he's, he's, he had a, he's had a massive influence on, on my career. Not even on my football career, just as a person. He's a real man manager. Um. I wanted to go and play play under him, so um, that was probably one of the best decisions I made as well. I played every week for him, and and we ended up getting promoted to the championship then, which was great. But not only that, you were starting to get, you know, I know we were getting provisional call ups to Matt on the L squad. You were really starting to impress, like, yeah, it was brilliant. Um, as I said, I was playing every week and I was scoring goals in, in League One and. We were we were just flying. We were we were and we were playing good football. We had some really good players there at the time, so we were playing good football as well. So there was a lot of people coming to watch us play, and obviously Martin had either come to watch us play or sent someone to watch us play, and I was playing well and just enjoying my football, loving it again, just playing every week. So getting called up was was unbelievable. It was um, when I got called into provisional squad. Obviously, I didn't make the final cup, but even that is something that I'm still proud of. Yeah, well, kind of leading off the back of that that season then, because you went on loan again. Um, were you thinking of coming back to Brighton that you might get a look in, or were you still very much of the mindset these are kind of moving kind of that way? Yeah, so obviously, obviously, I've done well <laughs> playing in League One, but playing in League One and um, playing in the Premier League is is completely different. You know, what I mean, I'm I'm realistic enough when it comes to things like that, so. I'd say the club was, as I said, the club were just were just going at, at a different level. They were they were they were going after like big players and spending a lot of money. So for me, I just wanted to go out and play again. Um, and then obviously with Rodrum getting promoted to the championship, I hadn't played really that much in the championship. So I was thinking, all right, this is another chance to go and go and play at a higher level. And and obviously being called into the provisional Ireland squads was was great. But I really wanted to play. I wanted to play for it, and that was that was my dream. Like you know what I mean. So to to go and play in the championship, like would have been would have been a good feather in the cap to to say, listen, I can play at a higher level. So going back out on loan was a no brainer, really. Yeah, did uh, you 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 would have played the full season there? So how was that? It was tough. Not gonna lie, like obviously we were massive underdogs in every game. But we actually we actually done quite well. Like we 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 are toured from bottom we were and then I think we only got relegated with like maybe a week or two to go. But we are like like with the with the team that we had at Rotherham and the manager and, and the coaching staff that we had there, like we were like never never die attitude. Like and as I said, he was a he was a great man manager and everybody wanted to to stay in the championship for him because he he was brilliant he was. But we just didn't have enough like I think if we had made a couple of sign- a couple of more signings that we could have stayed up, but we just didn't have that little bit of quality that was needed to stay in the championship because the championship's a tough league. Like, 
Yeah, I don't think enough people not know how actually tough it is till they get there. Like I talk to a lot of players, and they all say like the standard, like because there's so many foreign imports. I suppose that that might sound a bit bad saying that, but like coming into the Premier League, that a lot of players are kind of forced to go into the Championship and make their way back up. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, even like like last last year when we were playing Championship, like we had when we played against Villa. There was Tyrone Mings, Jack Grealish, John McGinn, like, and then as soon as they go up into the Premier League, like Jack Grealish ripping the Premier League up, Tyrone Mings getting called into the England squad, John McGinn talk about him going to Man United, like, so you see, like, them players are playing the Championship and they're unbelievable, but then when they go up into the Premier League, like, they're just as good as any of the other players in the Premier League. So you see how hard the championship actually is, and the likes of Leeds, West Brom, like they're not spend, spending massive money the year. And for a team like like Rotherham, for a club like Rotherham to compete with that is is very difficult. Did you take much from the experience? Yeah, I I just love playing in the championship. Like like I love testing myself against the best players, and to play in the championship, as I said, like the players that we were playing against were were of top quality. So playing against them just just made me a better player and I realised that you can't like you can't really rest on your laws like you have to be at it every single week like you couldn't have like a week in training where you were like going through the motions around because on a Saturday you'd just be destroyed you would like you had to you had to be at it all, every week for the whole season like and to be fair like I thought I thought I'd done really well playing the championship as well like like I really really enjoyed it and I didn't feel like I was out of place if that makes any sense so it was, uh, it was yeah. good. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. So when, then kind of, as I know I've kept you a long time here, so I'm, I'm, right. I'm really at the time. Ah, oh, sorry. But kind of coming back then to Brighton and then getting to Salford, how did that move come about? Well, at the end of the the long period uh, at Rotherham, I was out of contract, I was. So I never actually went back to Brighton. It was just like the contract was open and, and the club, like they, like they, they were brilliant. They had, giving me a new deal like two years before that when they got promoted to the Premier League they'd give me a new deal and they'd done everything they could for me really like and obviously as I said they were going in a different direction so I knew they weren't going to give me another contract they weren't so yeah I was I was out of contract and my partner she was she was pregnant again um, with her other little girl so I was half thinking oh, I'm just going to come home now because obviously my partner she's from Dublin and, and she's a real home board as well so she she wanted to come home and and raise the two kids in in Dublin. She did so. I was I was quite happy with that. Like I was probably gonna come back and play in the League of One, and then I had a few teams from the Championship, a couple from League One, and I was like, like the teams that were in Championship were like gonna be the same as Rotherham fighting relegation. I was thinking, I don't think I want to be a part of that again. Like like fighting relegation because it was it was tough mentally. It was as well. Um, obviously the teams in League One. Um, I was thinking, yeah, I could, I could do that. And then when when Salford came in, I was thinking I didn't really want to go. I'm gonna be honest, like I didn't really want to drop down to League Two after I've been playing the Championship. And then I spoke to to Gary Neville. He rang me, and we had a good chat for a while. And I was thinking he just told me what the what the plans of the club were. And obviously, I'd watched the the documentary on them, and it was something that intrigued me the way they had just I think they had seven promotions in a row or something like that. And uh, I spoke to Adam Rooney. I spoke to Rounds and I was like, "What's what's the story?" He was like, "Sign like he was like, it's a good, it's a good project. Like, come on board and and see what it's like." So I said, "The missus, like, what do you think?" Obviously, living in Manchester is it's a good place to live. Like, Manchester is a good city, so that's where we're living now. Um, and then after speaking to Gary Neville, I was like, "Yeah, you know what? I'll uh, I'll jump on board and ended up signing for them." Um, and it was good to be fair. It was, it was it's an exciting time, and it still is like. Yeah, well, I go back to when you when your earlier days before you supported Birmingham, and they were supporting Man United. Did you ever envision yourself playing under Gary Neville? No, no, that's what it's, it's so smart. It is like when when you think of these things, and um, that's what Rounds was Rounds was saying to me. Like when they went to Wembley, uh, and they got promoted to the playoffs last year, they all went back to David Beckham's pub and. In London, and he just said, "Like it's it's surreal, like you know what I mean. You're going back to Beckham's pub with him, going on the drink with with Bex and all the lads, like so." I was just thinking, imagine like 
if we got promoted again this year or, or something like that. It's just something that you never. It's a, it's a, it's a journey that you never know what can happen with because because of the type of club it is. Like it's realistically, it's not a League Two club because first of all the wages that they're paying, second of all the ambitions that they have. Like League Two clubs don't have ambitions to go to the Premier League or, or anything like that. So that's the type of ambitions that they have. Like. But I know you mentioned there about you know championship clubs, but the fact that it's all for you're going to be up near the top, and you're going to be you know a major part of, of history there if they get promoted once again, or you know the obviously the aim is to get up to the championship and Premier League in time. But for you to be a massive part of that, do you see if you can keep playing well that you might be able to catch Stephen's eye again because he would obviously know the the capabilities that you have. Yeah, that's another thing. You know, you never know. Like football, football is a strange game. It is um, and then obviously you see it's brilliant when you see like of Jack Bourne being called into into the Orleans squad, and it shows that just because a player is playing at a certain level doesn't mean that he's not capable of of stepping up and playing at a higher level. Do you know what I mean? So obviously, if if I was playing well for Salford and, and scoring a lot of goals, Stephen already knows what sort of character I am, so he knows. How hungry I am about football, and you know, it's the type of person I am. So, yeah, listen, it is, it'll be a massive dream and a massive honor for me to play for Ireland, but you never know what will happen. Yeah, well, listen, Richie, uh, I'm not going to keep you any longer. I really want to say that I've this has been a brilliant chat, and there's been a lot of stuff there that I didn't know about, and just yeah. being able to hear your story has been fantastic. So, thank you very much. No problem at all, Paul. It's great chatting with you. Yeah, I just want to t- tell anyone who's uh, given this a watch or a listen on the podcast, just make sure to drop a like. Don't forget to subscribe. Follow Richie on Instagram there, at Richie Tell. And uh, we'll speak to you guys soon.